Shall we pray? Our dear Father in heaven, thank you that um, you are so gracious unto us and uh, we praise you for giving us the gift of the Sabbath. And Lord, as uh, we even learn together, may the holy angels inspire the thoughts that we shall have in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Once again, uh, I welcome you into number six in the series, uh, Minneapolis 1888. And uh, I, I want to look at um, something uh, in today's presentation. We left at the point, was the message accepted and, or rejected? And uh, I think uh, the candid Bible student was able to know if uh, the message was uh, rejected, uh, accepted or rejected. But now I want to deal with another issue that uh, arose in Minneapolis, 1888, and that is stand by the old landmarks, stand by the old landmarks. And so we, we just want to see what was this brethren objecting to, were E.J. Wagner and uh, E.T. Jones uh, 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 doing away with the landmarks so that uh, actually uh, the brethren could say that stand by the old landmarks of what is what was happening in that uh, conference. And uh, just to set us off, uh, we read in uh, uh, Letters and Manuscript, Volume 5, and this is Letter 7, 1888, Paragraph 4. You wrote that plans were all laid and that uh, A.T. Jones and uh, Dr. Wagner and Willie White had things all prepared to make a drive at the general conference. And you won Elder Butler, a poor sick man, broken in body and mind, to prepare for the emergency. And in that conference, Elder Butler, that, that was the president by then, failed, called upon to send in telegrams and long letters and in quotes, saying to the delegates and to the old pioneers, stand by the old landmarks, just as although the Lord was not present at that conference and will not keep his hand on the work. So here is uh, Elder Kilgo and uh, Raya Smith, and they are writing to Elder Butler, who is at home sick because of things which are transpiring. And then he sends in telegrams to the delegates telling them that uh, stand by the old landmarks. And what are these old landmarks that uh, he is purporting that uh, they were being broken? Uh, we shall let actual inspiration answer. Were E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones uh, uh, doing away with the old landmarks? So Sister White in uh, Letters and Manuscript, uh, Volume 6, Manuscript 13, 1889, Paragraph 9, she says, the passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary, transpiring in heaven and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. Also, the first and second angel's message and the third, unfurling the banner of which was inscribed, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. One of the landmarks under the message was the temple of God seen by his truth-loving people in heaven and the ark containing the law of God. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of all landmarks. All this cry about changing the old landmarks is all imaginary. Now, I want you to capture that. Let us go through that. The old landmarks here, we have the cleansing of the sanctuary. We have the three angels' messages. We have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. These are all landmarks. Then we have the non-immortality of the soul. And then uh, we have the Sabbath as the old landmarks. And so all this cry by Elder Butler, Uriah Smith, Elder Kilgo, Morrison, and Etal, that um, Wagona and uh, Jones were doing away with the old landmarks, Sister Wise says that all this cry is but imaginary. So whether you talk about the covenants, whether you talk about um, the, the message of Christ and his righteousness, whether you talk about the law of uh, the law in Galatians, these were not landmarks. And so the truth that was being brought about uh, centering upon these topics was not actually even uh, uh, um, 
trampling or um, stepping on the old landmarks that had been set uh, 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 in Seventh Day Adventism. So uh, because these people were against what E.J. Wagner were, prepared, were presenting and E.T. Jones, they, they said that they were really doing away with the old landmarks and they told the, uh, the delegates and the ministers to stand, stand by the old landmarks, which was something which was unimaginary. These telegrams affected one of the delegates in the Minneapolis 1888. And we want just to read a little bit how he was affected and even came to a conclusion that actually E.G. White was not a prophet or the messenger of the Lord. And uh, you may guess that that man was none other than uh, the, the man Judson Sylvanus uh, uh, Washburn, born in 1863 and rested in 1955. Now, let us give a, a little historical background about um, the Minneapolis 1888, the letters of Butler, the telegram by Butler, standby of the old landmarks, and how this actually uh, uh, affected Judson and uh, uh, who was uh, a delegate in that conference. And uh, this is the little history, and it is very interesting to read about Adventist history. Jetson Sylvanus Washburn. Washburn was the son of a Sabbatarian Adventist pioneer, Calvin Washburn, who had joined the Advent movement during the Millerite movement of the 1840s. As a youth, J.S. Washburn had many opportunities to meet the founding pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Washburn claimed a rich SDA heritage. He was converted by Jane Andrews at the age of 11, baptized by James White at the age of 12, and began preaching Adventism at the age of 21. He worked in the Iowa Conference. It was from here that he came as a delegate to the 1888 General Conference session. The spiritual struggles that occurred at this meeting left him groping about his own spiritual life, a problem that he later sorted through by counseling with Ellen White. About this time, he also began a correspondence with Miss White that lasted through the rest of her life until her death in 1915. Rejuvenated spiritually by the message of righteousness by faith, Washburn went as a missionary uh, to England. Up until that time, the work in England had been struggling, but his creative tactics for drawing crowds and holding their attention literally changed the face of the child there from a small company of believers to literally hundreds who were converted at a time. There is evidence that British Adventism may not have survived but for his contribution as a powerful and creative evangelist. In addition to his intense study of the spirit of prophecy and desire to obtain in everything that Sister White wrote, Washburn's amazing memory enabled him to memorize much of the Bible and spirit of prophecy writings. By 1918, he claimed to have memorized Revelation, Romans, James, and 2 Peter. He noted that his memory improved with the study of the Bible and spirit of prophecy. By 1948, he claimed to have memorized the entire New Testament and was working toward committing Isaiah to memory. Watch a rich heritage that you have there, there for Jetson Sylvanus Washburn, memorizing the whole New Testament. Continuing with the history, there is a most remarkable story regarding Washburn in 1888 and Ellen White. And here is the story uh, when they came as delegates there. J.H. Washburn, who was a nephew of George I. Butler, who was the president of the General Conference, was 26 years old in the year of 1888, the year when Brother Wagner and Jones delivered to the Adventist Church the special message of righteousness by faith. When he first heard the message, he rejected it because he felt that it was contrary to the established teachings of the Adventist Church concerning the law of God. Thus, he sided with Brother Uriah Smith and J.H. Morrison in their disavowal of the doctrine. It was during this time that he first realized that Sister White was in full agreement with Jones and Wagoner. This knowledge led him to question Miss White's position as the Lord's messenger. After a short time of struggle, he met with Sister White and his doubts were dissolved. He later recalled. Writing, he says, writing in a uh, uh, this is a report interview with Elder J. Washburn conducted by 
uh, Robert Whelan in June 4th, 1915. Uh, recalling what was happening there, uh, he says, now I went to have a visit with her in her tent at the Ottawa meeting. I told her I had always thought and believed that she was a prophet, but I was disturbed by the Minneapolis episode. I had thought Uriah Smith and J.H. Morrison were right. Then Sister White interjected, do you know why J.H. Morrison left the conference early? She asked me. I replied, yes. Then she told me just what Morrison had said to me and the revelation of her apparently superhuman knowledge of that private confidential conversation frightened me, Washburn said. I realized that there was one who knew secrets. Sister White told me of her guide in Europe who had stretched his hands out and said, there are mistakes being made on both sides in this controversy of the Minneapolis 1888. Then she added that the law in Galatians is not the real issue of the conference. The real issue is righteousness by faith. Now, uh, again, she follows with the statement, E.J. Wagona can teach righteousness by faith more clearly than I can, said Sister White. Sister White admitting that E.J. Wagona could teach righteousness by faith more than herself was a prophetess and a messenger of the Lord. And this she is confessing to Washburn, who had been affected by his uncle, who was the president of the General Conference, G.I. Butler, sending in telegrams and uh, telling the people to stand by the old landmarks. And Josh Washburn thought that uh, these brethren, Wagner and Jones, were wrong. So when Sister White said E.J. Wagner can teach righteousness by faith more clearly than she herself can, uh, uh, um, uh, Washburn asked, why Sister White? I said that, do you mean to say that E.J. Wagner can teach it better than you can with all your experience? Sister White replied, yes, the Lord has given him special light on that question. I have been wanting to bring it more clearly but I could not have brought it out as clearly as he did. But when he brought it out at Minneapolis, I recognized it. Now, that is, uh, I can say that is humility on the side of the messenger of the Lord. To admit that somebody who was not a pioneer, but just a Bible student could present a subject more clearly than she could present it was something that uh, was really uh, an attribute of humility and not a self gain glory. And think about it. She said that she had been preaching this message for 45 years, but none could understand it apart from the husband, James White. But when she heard Wagner and Jones present it, all the fiber of her being said, Amen. And so, how is it that the prophetess had been presenting the message for 45 years and people could not, she, she could not bring it out clearly? And then the Lord gives it to another person because the Lord didn't want people to look to any man or any prophet or any messenger. The message was more important than the messenger. And so this issue of looking unto Sister White or looking unto that and that, really at this point comes at a, the crux of the matter that we don't have to rely on people, but we have to rely on the message that is being delivered. If God could bypass the messenger and bring in a novice just to bring out the message clearly, then the Lord can use whomsoever he will. And it is not for us to question, why have you actually used this and this? In fact, Paul in Romans, he says, can a, a, a pot ask the potter, what do it with me? That can never. And so we don't have to ask the Lord, why should you not use the messenger or why should you not use these old pioneers to bring out the message? You use this novice. God that time wanted to test the people if they were relying on men or if they were relying on Jesus Christ. And so continued on, uh, continued on, we read <clears throat> that uh, after the meeting, J. As Washburn and his wife became dear friends with E.G. White, Brother Washburn was the pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Washington. Miss White was a visitor in their home on occasion, and the Ellen White estate has a record of several letters that Sister White wrote to the couple. 
One of the letters read, may the Lord continue to bless the church in Washington is my prayer. I know the Lord blessed me when I was with you and he blessed his people. Much love to all in your household and much love to those with whom we took sweet counsel together in our precious meetings. The Lord lives and reigns. Praise his holy name. That is writing to J. Schwarzman. And so the issue is, why was G.I. Butler, Rice Smith, Kilgoris, and uh, Morrison crying out that the um, landmarks were being destroyed and influenced? Now, this is just a confession of one person, that is Jadson Washburn, that um, actually that meeting was um, to him uh, uh, something that really troubled him. But there are many people who actually were troubled by this, that uh, uh, the pioneers were saying that uh, these new brethren were doing away with the old landmarks. But as we see, this cry of removing the old landmarks were actually uh, uh, just an imaginary. So, continued on with this history, it was the conference rejection of the special message of righteousness by faith, first given in 1888, that caused the writing of several letters from Miss White to the Washburns. This rejection greatly sorrowed Sister White, and she wrote to Brother Jesh Washburn to encourage him to continue in the race of the Son of Righteousness, for she knew that he had now fully accepted the message. Mr. Washburn became known as a true believer in the spirit of prophecy, and Ellen White considered him as a defender of the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. And so um, we find that uh, actually the meeting was something which was uh, troubling. And uh, if it were not just for the masses of God, then, uh, uh, then uh, many of the people who attended uh, that meeting could have not been uh, uh, benefited by it. And uh, so we have to ask ourselves today, what is hindering uh, uh, the message going forth as the Lord would want it to go forth? What is hindering the message to go forth as the Lord would uh, uh, want it to go forth? It is because men have again turned to what happened in Minneapolis 1888 and uh, they are looking unto men instead of looking unto Christ. And uh, can we confidently say that, uh, as uh, E.G. White says in uh, Life Sketches, page 196, that uh, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise our God. And as I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as a leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Can we confidently say that the Lord has led us? And if the Lord has led us, why are we still here? It may be that we are still in 1888 where we are looking at men. If this man accepts a thing, then we can go forward. If they don't accept, then we will reject it. In uh, counsels to writers and uh, editors, I just want to pull out something, uh, something that uh, really interests me sometimes so much uh, when she talks about um, what is happening among us today. As it was back in 1888, what is really happening among us? Uh, you hear the Christ stand by the old, mark, old landmarks. You hear about uh, many things. People just saying we believe like this and we believe like this and these are landmarks. Even the church itself, the mainstream church, it has it is fundamental beliefs. And it says that this is what we believed and we are growing in it. But it is all imaginary. That is why we are still here. But listen to what she says in Council to Writers and Editors. Council to Writers and Editors from page 39. Uh, reading on, this is what we are told. The fact that there is no controversy or agitation among God's people should not be regarded as conclusive evidence that they are holding fast to sound doctrine. The people in 1888 thought that they had uh, actually the sound doctrine, but when an agitation came, when a controversy came as it seemed, it found actually many they were not holding to sound doctrine. And it can be today that we are holding to so many things that we think they are landmarks and pillars, but let an agitation or a controversy arise and we shall be found that we are not holding fast to the sound doctrine. She continues to say, 
there is a reason to fear that they may not be clearly discriminating between truth and error. When no new questions are started by investigation of the scriptures, when no difference of opinion arises with which will set men to searching the Bible for themselves to make sure that they have the truth, there will be many now, as in ancient time, who will hold to tradition and worship they know not what. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of the present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidence of their faith. They have no just appreciation of their work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they cannot give a satisfactory reason. I repeat that when the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until that's tested, they knew not their great ignorance. And she concludes by saying, and they are, there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until conrovers arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Certain is it that there has been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to men, putting human wisdom in place of divine. And this was the controversy in 1888. When you read uh, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 91 and 92, we are told that people had lost sight of Jesus Christ. They were looking unto men, and they had to be pointed back to the divine picture to receive Jesus Christ as he was, and then receive his righteousness. Is it true that today we are holding on to things that um, when actually they are examined, we shall be found like the people who are in the conference of uh, uh, 1888. It is evident then that uh, it is a time everyone examined what they believe, search the scriptures and uh, see if what they believe is the truth and it can be substantiated from uh, the scriptures and from uh, uh, the spirit of prophecy. Our pillars, principles, landmarks, and waymarks. So what were our principles prior to 1888? We want to see if we were going against them or if we were still on them as, or if Wagoners was on, still on them or not uh, on them. And so we look at the landmarks. And uh, in early writing, page 63.1 and point two. We read, I saw the necessity of the messengers, especially watching and checking all fanatism wherever they might see it arise. Satan is pressing in on every side, and unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole arm of God, the fiery darts of the wicked will hit us. There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is the present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such a subjects as what? One, the sanctuary, in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is Establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. This I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. So we have what the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, that is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Essentially, we had mentioned it earlier. We have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Those are the landmarks. And we are looking at the all landmarks, the waymarks and the pillars. So now we have uh, two of them. Let us continue on again. She says in Special Testimony Series B, Volume 2, 
page 59, we are continuing to see the landmarks, the waymarks, and the pillars. What were they? We are God's commandment keeping people. For the past 50 years, every face of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to be cloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word, especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. And the message of heaven for these last days as given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation. So we had uh, the sanctuary uh, in connection with the 2300 days. Now we have, and then we had the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Then now we have uh, the three angels' messages in connection with those messages that uh, we already have. So we have three of them now. Messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth which, point by point, has been sought out by prayerful study and testified to by the miracle-working power of the Lord. But the waymarks which have been made, uh, which have made us what we are, are to be preserved. And they will be preserved as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. He calls upon us to hold family with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority the cleansing of the sanctuary in connection are uh, the, the the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days the commandments of god and the faith of jesus christ and the three angels messages again what does she add on that these there are the main pillars of our faith subjects which are of of vital interest the sabbath and the keeping of the commandments of God. So now we have another fourth one being added there. The Sabbath stands alone as a pillar. You have the commandments of God, the faith of the, and the faith of Jesus Christ. You have the cleansing of the sanctuary with the connection with in connection with the 2300 days. You have the three angels' messages, and now you have the Sabbath standing just alone as a pillar. Speculative ideas should not be agitated, for there are peculiar minds that love to get some point that others do not accept and argue and attract everything that one point, at one point, uh, urging that point, magnifying that point, when it is really a matter of which is not of vital importance and will be understood differently. Twice, I have been shown that everything of a character to cause our brethren to be diverted from the very points not essential for this time should be kept in the background. And then she goes ahead to mention some of these Waymarks, landmarks, and the pillars. In uh, manuscript, manuscript 13, 1889, she says, The passing of the time in 1884 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. Also, the first and the second angel's message and the third, unfurling the banner, on which was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the landmarks under the message was the temple of God, seen by his truth-loving people in heaven and the ark containing the law of God. The light up of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. And now she adds the fifth thing, because we had already four, the non-immortality of the wicked is an all landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that uh, can come under the head of the old landmarks. All this cry about changing the old landmarks is all imaginary. So we go again. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ, the cleansing of the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, and then um, we have uh, what we call the Sabbath, standing as a pillar alone, and then we have the non-immortality of uh, the soul. And, and, and this, she calls them actually the, the, the landmarks. And then we have the sanctuary as a, a landmark. The scripture, which above all others had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith, was the declaration until 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Daniel 8.14. This had been familiar words to all believers in the Lord's soon coming. By the lips of thousands of this prophecy, repeated as the watchword of their faith. All felt that upon the events therein foretold depended their brightest expectations and most cherished hopes. These prophetic days has, had been shown to terminate in the autumn of 1844. 
In common with the rest of the Christian world, Adventists then held that the earth or some portion of it was the sanctuary. They understood that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the purification of the earth by the fires of the last great day, and that this would take place at the second advent, hence the conclusion that Christ would return to the earth in 1844. These, those, who are, those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard, those who try to bring in theories that will remove the pillars of our faith, she adds another one, concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. So let us uh, jog again our mind. Here we have the sanctuary uh, in connection with the 2300 days. And then you have the commandments of God and, and the faith of Jesus Christ. You have um, the Sabbath as a landmark. You have the non-immortality of uh, the soul. And uh, you have the personality of God or of Christ. And this is very interesting. What are the landmarks? And so she goes ahead and an adds another one in 1T, volume uh, volume 1 of Testimonies, page 300. The only safety now is to search for the truth as revealed in the word of God as for hid treasure. The subject of the Sabbath, the nature of man, and the testimony of Jesus are the great important truths to be understood. So she, she, she talks about this way, Max, and now she adds the nature of man and the testimony of Jesus, adding to the way, Max, that uh, we have to restudy. Now, I have a picture here, and uh, I just bring them all together now. What she says were the landmarks, the waymarks, and the pillars of Adventism prior to 1888. And as we go through this, we have to ask ourselves, what was this cry about? Stand by the pillars, stand by the waymarks, stand by the old landmarks of our faith. What was this cry by Uriah Smith and uh, G.I. Butler and Elder Kilgo about uh, people standing by the old landmark? What was E.J. Wagner and Alonzo Trevor Jones removing as a landmark? So let us go through this. We have the law of God, where the Sabbath light flashing brighter than the other commandments. That is number one. We have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ as number two. And number three, we have the personality of God and of Christ. Number three, we have the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days. Uh, that is number four. We have non-immortality of the wicked. Number five, we have the three angels' messages as number six. And number seven, we have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, the nature of man and the nature of Christ appears under the non-immortality of the wicked and also under the personality of God and Christ. That is, uh, the nature of Christ uh, is found in the personality of God and of Christ, and the nature of man is found in the non-immortality of the wicked. And so these are lumped together, so they are not nine, but uh, there are seven pillars which were considered most important at that time. We ask ourselves, among these seven, which one was Jones and Wagoner doing away with? You find that uh, they were saying E.J. Wagoner and Jones were so honest with the message of righteousness by faith, as we read in the previous presentation, and so they had to preach about the law. So it was like Jones and Wagoner were doing away with the law of God. But actually, if you want to know somebody who preached about the law, then they are two, these two brethren, and they have their uh, works on the book of Genesis chapter 1, and they go through the law as nothing else, which somebody can read. And so this cry that they were doing away with the law by preaching righteousness by faith actually is nothing. We have the commandments of God. This one, actually, they preach Christ in the law, in the commandments, and amplified it. And so you cannot say, actually, Jones and Wagner were doing away with the law or the commandments of God because they said that uh, the message of justification by faith was to bring to prominence the divine nature of Jesus Christ and he was 
are, are, are ready to dispense or he is able to dispense with the rich gifts of his merit so that the people may be obedient to his law. So such a statement, you cannot read such a statement and say this person is doing away with the law. The same person who is saying that when Christ gives you his righteousness, you can be able to keep all his commandments. Let us go to the third one, the personality of God and of Christ. Now, this one, no Adventist can say that Wagner or Jones were doing away with the personality of God and Christ. I just recommend Christ, uh, our righteousness, by, um, is it Christ, our righteousness, or Christ and his righteousness? Uh, Christ and his righteousness. Christ and his righteousness by uh, 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 E.J. Wagner. If you read that masterpiece, then you will never say that E.J. Wagner was doing away with the, the personality of God or Christ. Let us go to the cleansing of the sanctuary, the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days. Now, uh, Wagner and Alonzo Trevor Jones were not, Jones were not uh, actually pioneers, but they came in later after 1844. But um, there is no way you can teach Victor over sin and not uh, teach about the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, because this was their major concern. Can a person live a victorious life? And the answer was, unto 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And uh, I have writings by uh, Jones where he goes uh, in details about the cleansing of the sanctuary and says that uh, actually it is a message of victory over sin. The, 23, the, the cleansing of the sanctuary and uh, in connection with the 2300 days. Uh, if uh, the series still allows, we can have that where she talks up in fully about uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary, connecting it um, with uh, the, clean, the two cleansings of the temple when Christ was on the earth. She, he says that uh, those two cleansings of the temple when Christ was on the earth, they can be seen antitypically in the day of atonement, first in the starting of the work, in the heavenly sanctuary where actually the 50,000 when the sanctuary were cleansed only remained 50 people. And then in the final cleansing where actually when Christ was on the earth, uh, he cleansed the sanctuary from it is sacrilegious uh, 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 worship and services. And so in the end time, when there is a call to come out of Babylon, there was, will be the final cleansing of the sanctuary in antitype. Uh, of uh, what he did on the earth. And so you cannot say that these brethren were doing away with the sanctuary message. Then an immortality of the wicked. Now, this is another message that uh, actually, uh, I haven't gone into details to look into Jones and Wagner material, but uh, I have never seen something that is uh, against uh, what actually Adventist, uh, Adventist preach. Uh, the three angels' messages, did Wagner and Jones do away with the three angels' messages? Now you have to read about the aims of the papacy, the works by these brethren, and see how they amplify the three angels' messages and what the papacy is thinking to do, changing times and the laws. But uh, the only solution to this is uh, the, 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 the three angels' messages. And so uh, these are actually imaginary uh, 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 imaginary information that uh, these people were uh, doing away with the pillars of our faith. The last one is uh, the testimony of Jesus, of Jesus, which is actually uh, the spirit of prophecy and not only limited to uh, uh, e, uh, to uh, E.G. White. And uh, Wagner and Jones really accepted the testimony of Jesus, even when they were rebuked uh, after the Minneapolis uh, conference. In the latter times, maybe you can say that they went astray because um, of uh, some disappointment that were happening, but actually these were ardent believers in the testimony of Jesus, uh, both as it is revealed in um, the works of uh, E.G. White and uh, the other pioneers. And so, overall, looking at uh, the pillars of our faith, the waymarks and uh, the landmarks, there is nothing that you can point unto and say, actually, this brethren were doing away with. This cry by our pioneers that stand by the old landmarks was only imaginary. If they were talking about the law in Galatians, then that was not actually a pillar of our faith. It was not a waymark. It was not an old landmark. If you can, if, if they say that um, the covenants 
then you cannot say that actually that was again a pillar. Uh, we had some teachings that they made, but this was not a pillar. And so it was all but imaginary that we should stand uh, by our own landmark. And so let us go back then as we bring this to a close, what did God want to be taught in Minneapolis? We, we have looked at this in some scattered way, but we are still continuing to build up until we shall bring together the puzzle that fits uh, like a hand and a globe. What did God want to be taught? And did really we're gonna teach that in John's? Here is uh, um, what Sister White says, in 1888 materials page 673. The third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which light which will lighten the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. The work that uh, might have been done will be left undone by the rejectors of truth because of their unbelief. Then in the midst, he says, messages bearing the divine credentials have been sent to God's people, the glory, the majesty, the righteousness of Christ, full of goodness and truth have been presented the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ has been set forth among us with beauty and loveliness to charm all whose hearts were not closed with prejudice. We know that God has wrought among us. So Sister White saying, the message about the fullness of the Godhead of Jesus Christ has been presented among us. And then in the beginning, she says that the third angel's message has been preached, but it has not been comprehended. So now we have the testimony of the Lord's messenger saying the third angel's message has been presented before us. And who are these people who are presenting the message? That is Jones and Wagona. And so somebody to say that maybe Wagona didn't and Jones didn't preach the three angels' messages, it is to conflict what Sister White is reporting in 1888 material that uh, the third angel's message had been preached. And then these messages of um, the righteousness of Christ has been preached. And the fullness of the Godhead of Jesus Christ has been presented. That is the personality of God or Christ has been presented. And so this issue that uh, they were not preached actually is only imaginary and uh, something that uh, we cannot uh, um, substantiate. And then we are told the people had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person. That is the setting full of the Godhead of Jesus Christ among us. And then in uh, Letters and Manuscript, Volume 5, MS 24, 1888, we are looking at the message that had to be preached. Did E.J. Wagner and Alonzo Trevor Jones preach the message? We have found that they preached the three angels' messages. That is a witness by E.G. Uh, e. White. They preached the fullness of the Godhead of Jesus Christ. And then she adds, the divine picture of Christ must be kept before the people. He is that angel standing in the sun of heaven. He reflects no shadows. Clothed in the attributes of deity, shrouded in the glorious deity, and in the likeness of the infinite God, he is to be lifted up before men. When this is kept before the people, creature merit sinks into insignificance. The more the eye looks upon him, the more his life, his lessons, his perfection of character are studied, the more sinful and abhorrent will, uh, will sin appear. By beholding, Man can but admire and become more attracted to him, more charmed and more desirous to be like Jesus until he assimilates to his image and has the mind of Christ. Like Enoch, he walks with God. His mind is full of thoughts of Jesus. He is his best friend. So here again, we have the cleansing of the sanctuary and victory over sin. And you cannot have victory over sin while you are trampling upon the commandments of God. These are the messages that were to be preached, and E.J. Wagner and Jones were preaching them, but yet the old guards were saying they were doing away with the old landmarks. All this was imaginary. And so she says in MS 24, 1888, I wished to meditate, to pray, that I might know in what manner we could work to present the subject of sin and atonement in the Bible light before the people. Think about that. That she was praying, how best can we bring this out? Meaning that it was being brought out, but the people were not comprehending a thing or their, their hearts had been just locked. 
And so here we have the cleansing of the sanctuary because she says the subject of sin and atonement in the Bible light. And so if um, what was the problem? Why did the people not understand what these brethren were really presenting on the subject of sin and atonement? We can get it from this quote. They were greatly needing this kind of instruction that they might give the light to others and have the blessed privilege of being workers together with God in gathering and bringing home the sheep of the fold. What power must we have from God that icy hearts, having only a legal religion, should see the better things provided for them, Christ and his righteousness? A life-giving message was needed to give life to the dry bones. So what is the problem? Legal religion, which can be concluded like this, we have preached the law until we have become as dry as the hills of what? Gilboa. So legal religion was the problem here with the delegates. What was another problem? Icy hearts. Hearts which were uh, locked by prejudice. It could not comprehend the subject of sin and atonement, although it was being presented there. So the problem here is not the messengers and the message, but the people who are gathered at Minneapolis, having a, a legal religion and having icy hearts. And so um, exaggerated statements from both camps. She says, I told them I had not been shown that some, I told them, the, I told them I had been shown that some of our brethren had educated themselves as debaters. Another problem now. The process of this education and the mold received by such an education were not after God's order, neither did they meet the approval of God. In many respects, men trained in this kind of school and fitted themselves to become pastors of the sheep and lambs. And in combating an opponent, as in the way of discussions, usually harm is done with but little good results. The combative spirit is raised in both parties, and a defined hard spirit becomes habitual when their track is crossed. They become criticizers and do not always handle the scriptures fairly, but raise the scripture to make their point. Now, looking at these last things, the remark was made. And this is, listen to this. The remark was made, if our views of Galatians are not correct, then we have not the third angel's message. Remember what they said, that these brethren were doing away with what? The old landmarks, the waymarks, and the pillars of our faith. And what are they hanging on to show that Wagner and Jonas are doing away with these three things. They say, if our views of Galatians are not correct, then we have not the third angel's message. And our position goes by the board. There is nothing to our faith. Can you imagine brethren pioneers saying that if our understanding on Galatians is wrong, then we do not have the three angels' messages. We do not have anything for our faith to hold on. It's, it's just amazing. I don't know what they were thinking. But he said, she says, I say, this is Sister White saying to them, brethren, here is the very thing I have been telling you. This statement is not true. Which statement? That if our views on Galatians is not correct, then we do not have the third angel's message. We do not have anything. We have nothing to our faith. And she's telling them, if that is what you believe, then this statement is not true. And by the way, you can go to uh, an average Adventist if you like and ask them how much they have preached about Galatians in connection with the third angel's message, and you will find that none, maybe none has ever done that. And so to say that the three angel's messages hangs on the book of Galatians, the law in Galatians, then I think it is an exaggerated statement to make. She says, this statement, it is an extravagant, exaggerated statement. And that is what I can say. If it is made in the discussion of this question, I shall feel it my duty to set this matter before all that are assembled, and whether they hear or forbear, tell them the statement is incorrect. The question at issue is not a vital question and should not be treated as such. 
That is the question about the law in Galatians. It cannot be said it is the one that is holding the three angels' messages and all our faith. The wonderful importance and magnitude of this subject has been exaggerated. And for this reason, through misconception and perverted ideas, we see the spirit that prevails at this meeting, which is unchristlike, and which we should never see exhibited among brethren. There has been a spirit of Pharisaism coming in among us, which I shall lift my voice against wherever it may be revealed. MS 24, 1888. She says in uh, Paulson Collection, page 154. What was the final great danger in Minneapolis? The conference at Minneapolis was the golden opportunity for all to, for all present to humble the heart before God and to welcome Jesus as the great instructor. But the stand taken by some at that meeting proved their ruin. They have never seen clearly seen, and they never will, for they persistently cherish the spirit that prevailed there a wicked, criticizing, dunindietory spirit. Yet since that meeting, abundant light and evidence has been graciously given that all might understand the truth. Those who were then deceived might seem to have come to the light. They might rejoice in the truth as it is in Jesus. Were it not for the pride of their own rebellious hearts, they will be asked in the judgment, who required this at your hand? that rise up against the message and the messengers I sent to my people with light, with grace and power. Why have you lifted up your souls against God? Why did you block the way with your own perverse spirit? And afterward, when evidence was piled upon evidence, why did you not humble your hearts before God and repent of your rejection of the message of mercy he has sent you? The Lord has not inspired these brethren to resist the truth. He designed that they should be baptized with the Holy Spirit and be living channels of light to communicate the light to our world in clear, bright rays. And so, uh, recently, we have been hearing the pre precious doctrine of justification by faith. This is not a new doctrine, for Paul declares the just shall live by faith in Romans 1.17. But it has been buried under the rubbish of error, and now by diligent, persevering effort, it has been rescued and placed in the framework of truth. We find the Savior when we seek for him with the whole heart. Honest, continuous prayer will give us humble hearts, ready to receive the truth as it is in Jesus and to teach the lesson learned in the school of Christ. Satan's work is to misrepresent the Father and the Son, false dishonoring ideas of God prevail in this world to a large degree. Of many who claim to know God, it may be said as it was Cyrus, I guarded thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah 45.5 The Lord will give light to his people, to those who are willing to design spiritual things. He will give knowledge, and this knowledge they are to give to others. To know the Father and the Son is the highest knowledge that man can obtain. The Lord is raising up men to proclaim the truth for this time. His word is ringing out, go forward as, is, as it is in Exodus 14, 15. And yet I am pained to see that some who are standing in the front ranks are listless and faithless, waiting for an impelling power to move them against their own will. The Lord's providences are not designed and our people are far behind where they should be. Finishing. Providence is going before us and in infinite power is working with human effort. Blind indeed must be the eyes that do not see the working of the Lord and deaf the ears that do not hear the call of the true shepherd to his sheep. The efforts of God's light bearers to be, are to be constant and honest. A living church will reflect light to all around and God's name will be glorified. Those who open their hearts to the knocking of Jesus will understand how to reach those who are in the same condition as they themselves once were. It makes my heart sad as I see our people repeating the history of the past. In my experience, since the Minneapolis meeting, I have been compelled to see the influence that prejudice exerts on the mind. It fills the chambers of the heart with the darkness of midnight, distorts the reasoning power, misapplies and misinterprets the word of God, and leaves the mark of confusion on the mind. Under its guidance, the blind lead the blind. 
and that is in MS 31, 1889, paragraph one. And so um, lastly, when they got tired of E.J. Wagoner and Jones and E.G. White, they decided to send her in Australia for nine years and without help, but uh, uh, this is not my area in this, um, this is not what I'm going to tackle in the in this uh, session of uh, Minneapolis 1888. But then, after they got tired of her, they sent her in Australia because they were, they just didn't want to hear her. And we close with the statement. She says, I have not, I think, revealed the entire workings that led me here to Australia. Perhaps you may never fully understand the matter. The Lord was not in our living America. He did not, and remember she's writing in 1888 material of what is transpiring. They were sent to Australia. He did not reveal that it was his will that I should leave Battle Creek. The Lord did not plan this, but he let you all move after your own imaginings. The Lord would have had Willie White, his mother, and her workers remain in America. We were needed at the heart of the work and had your, special, had your spiritual perception Design the true situation, you will never have consented to the movements made. But the Lord read the hearts of all. There was so great a willingness to have us live that the Lord permitted this thing to take place. And then she drops the bomb. Those who are weary of the testimonies, those who are tired of the testimonies born or being given were left without the person who bore them. Our separation from Battle Creek was to let men have their own will and way which they thought superior to the way of the Lord. What a statement at last to make that people were tired of the messages and the messengers. And they decided to send them away. They sent, they separated these three people. They sent E.G. White to Australia. They say they send um, that is um, Wagona to Europe. And uh, I think uh, John is, is the one who remained, uh, Jones is the one who remained in America uh, uh, between the two, either one went to UK and another one. I think uh, it is Wagona who went to UK and had the paper, the UK present truth. And so the cry that stand by the all landmarks was actually an imaginary cry. We have gone through these messages and found out that uh, according to the pillars, actually there's nothing that Wagner and Jones were taking away from the pillars of our faith. Now, what is the moral lesson in this? Because just information without uh, giving a moral lesson don't help in any way. The greatest tragedy that can ever happen to a denomination is it is identity being stolen from them. It is called an identity theft. If we do not have our history right, we may think that we are standing in the position which God has ordained that we should stand in when we are doing something so different. Here were the people in 1888 saying that they are standing on the landmarks, on the waymarks and the pillars of our faith. Yet it was found that it was all imaginary. Can it be true today that the church let us say the mainstream church, the independent ministries and self-supporting ministries are saying that we are standing on the pioneers platform or the platform of truth and persecuting each other, throwing each other out of the churches and their fellowship, but only doing the work that was going on in Minneapolis where actually the pioneers of our faith, some of them, not all, were actually persecuting the servants of the Lord that were sent to them. Is it that the Lord can have a truth, the old truth set in new light to his people, and then people arise today and say, hold on to the landmarks, stand by the landmarks, when actually what they are saying is imaginary. May we search again amongst ourselves to see these things that we say that are the truth and are the fundamental beliefs? Are they true, the fundamental beliefs that the Lord has designed that we should believe in? And I can say that uh, many of the things that uh, we say that uh, are right are all imaginary. If they were true and we defended them forthrightly, the Lord will bring the latter rain 
and the loud cry will be sounded and it won't take long and Jesus Christ will come back. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us as we continue studying these things together until next presentation where we shall be looking at um, uh, we shall be looking at the issue of uh, uh, the covenants. This is another issue that actually uh, uh, the pioneers had a problem. Uriah Smith had a problem, but uh, E.G. White was able to write to him and tell him, if Wagner has presented what I presented in PP, then he is on the truth. And in another quote, she said that this fighting against the covenant is uh, and studying about it and researching it is, is uh, a waste of time because what has been presented is truth. So in the next presentation, we shall be having the covenants and see what did you, Sister White say about the covenant? What was Wagona and Jones preaching about the covenants? Otherwise, may God continue guiding us into full right, light and not only giving us the information, but that information may change us into the full stature and the measure of uh, the man, Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Dear Father, we thank you for the blessings of uh, your word. And that, Lord, it is uh, uh, more sharper than a double-edged sword. And that is what we want because it is a knife of a shepherd and not a knife of a butcher. And so let the truth cut us and uh, bring in a revival and reformation. Uh, the truth which has been buried in the rubbish of error and traditions, Lord, that uh, it may be revived and set upon in a new setting that uh, the people may be able to receive it. Bless your people and bless your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.